Hi, welcome back to the Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Dan Schultz. Dan is the head of Red Jade McHenry in McHenry, Illinois, through which he teaches in-person and online classes in Kung Fu and Tai Chi. He's also the author, author of several books, including Combative Methods of Monkey Boxing and Drunken Boxing, Breaking Through into Advanced Practice. Hey, Dan, how are you today? I'm doing wonderful. I'm happy to be here. Very honored. Well, we're happy to have you. So I guess we'll get started at the beginning like we do with all of our guests and ask uh, how, how you got interested in martial arts in the first place. What, what led you to this path? Well, the beginning is a very, uh, uh, not a very inspiring story. It was more of a parents <laughs> making me do things because uh, like I, when I was like around five or six years, which is when I got into martial arts, I was uh, right around the time when Super Nintendo got very popular. So uh, they got me a Super Nintendo and I was like hooked on that. And thus they told me that I needed to become more active. So they gave me an ultimatum where I could either uh, do this karate practice that they had uh, in Spring Grove or I could do ballet with my sister. So <laughs> my choice was clear. <laughs> <laughs> That's some smart parenting right there. I have to remember yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. T feel free to take it. <laughs> yeah, but, that's uh, nice for our audience. Yeah, so, so, I, so I did a Japanese karate for a, a lot of my early practice. And then uh, it was around like a early teen phase that I started getting into uh, Chinese martial arts. I uh, went to a place that uh, started me in Shaolin Kung Fu and uh, Yang style Tai Chi. And then when that place closed down, I went to uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin, where I practiced uh, Southern Hungar, some more Northern Shaolin, and then the uh, Yang style Tai Chi. And I got to experience, I didn't get to uh, practice myself, but uh, Sun style Tai Chi as well. And then from there, I moved on to uh, my current teacher, Shifu Neil Ripsky, of which I practiced uh, first drunken boxing, because that was the first thing I saw that he had that was like something I was looking for ever since, you know, Jackie Chan's drunken boxing or his uh, drunken master movies. Right. And so, uh, yeah, I, I got hooked on that. And uh, over time, I started to get more interested in the other disciplines he was teaching. Like uh, Chen style Tai Chi was first my uh, my first branching off into other styles since uh, meeting him. And then after that, into a Chung style Bagua, and then uh, Xin Lil He and Xing Yi Chen. And then from there, I decided to uh, fully devote myself to his system. So I learned the entire Ma family Kung Fu curriculum from uh, start to finish everything that encompassed with all the uh, the internal styles, with all the animal styles and the long fist methods. And uh, that's what I've been uh, dedicating myself to for the most part. So uh, my current teacher, Shifu Neil Ripsky, at the time when I met him, he was living in Canada. So I've been going off and on to his practices for a month at a time, of which he uh, had a full-time training program, which was like about eight hours a day, like five to eight hours a day of training and not including a quota that we had to complete before we started our day of training. So it was a pretty much like a full-time job working yeah. training. And uh, I did that for uh, several years going back and forth and as well as meeting him in several different uh, locations across the world in Israel and the UK, and Thailand, and uh, just meeting him there and eventually having him. Uh, well, eventually he told me I started to have need to have a school myself which was not my plan. I planned it in the future, but he told me basically, you need to start teaching now. I'm like, okay, I'll start teaching. <laughs> so I started teaching and uh, eventually he started to come out for seminars at my school and teaching my students and uh, and drawing other people into the school. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much where we're at now as far as like uh, things go, just going back and forth to meet each other. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Neil's an amazing martial artist and he's a he's a friend of the organization here. So I'd like to talk to about him just a little bit more in a minute. But um, when you, going back just a bit, when you went to Waukesha, uh, your instructor there was uh, Steve Klepp. Is that his name? Yep, yeah, that was. His name. And how long did you study with him? Ooh, I think that's around like five to six -ish years. I think around there. Like I started with the Hungar because I had already done a. a northern shaolin i wanted to try something new so i started with their uh, hungar curriculum and uh, also doing the uh, tai chi curriculum as well because i wanted to pers continue pursuing the internal styles as well and then 
probably about towards the end of like the last year that I went there, I started to incorporate their Northern Shaolin curriculum as well, just because I, I figured I could handle the curriculums, like uh, the material at the same time, especially because I already had experience in the Northern style before. So you I had a strong foundation even before you met Shifu Ripsky, then you had a pretty, pretty good background. Yeah. yeah the, when, uh, after yeah. teaching me for a bit, he started to open up with me more about, uh, what he was thinking of me. And he told me that he was excited because I already had a strong base. So there was no real needing to create the shapes at this point. It was just putting fuel in the machine as it were. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I talked to him recently and, you know, he, he had a, obviously, you know, he's well known for his drunken styles and it's something I do a little bit myself. <clears throat> he had a lot of great insights into it. just about how you have to have that basic foundation because, you know, to a, an outsider or a person who's never done martial arts at all, they see drunken style and it's a lot of weaving around and this and that and the other, but you have to have those, um, that basic outline so that you can sort of draw outside the lines, so to speak. You know, if you, if you don't have that, you, you can't really do effective drunken style. Absolutely. Yeah. My, my experience with it uh, is a very interesting because I, I had all the, I had all the shapes and such of a uh, Orthodox Kung Fu, though I didn't really quite understand what internal was yet. And when I met him, I, I thought I had an idea, but I guess I just didn't, it didn't quite click for me yet. So uh, when I met him, we were learning drug boxing and he was teaching me internal throughout. And uh, then after branching into the other styles, into the internal styles, he, uh, we had to re-orthodox me because <laughs> I was very unorthodox at that point, <laughs> having to learn how to be straight again, rather than, uh, find the straightness within the curves of drunken boxing as it were having to realign the pole and everything it was very it was very frustrating for the opposite reasons yeah rather than having to unlearn the orthodox i had to unlearn the unorthodox so i had to reverse yeah it's very humbling when you have to when you get to that point where you have to start everything all over again or you think you're starting all over again it doesn't really take that long so, yeah. so how, how did you meet um, Shifu Ripsky? Did, the, did you attend a seminar of his or how did you hear about him? It was through YouTube. Like oh. I saw a couple of his videos like very early on. He had like a, the stepping form, I think, at that point. And uh, I was just looking for any drunken boxing vids I could at that point. And uh, when he first uploaded like a couple vids, I'm like, okay, this is cool. And it was like mostly like basic Orthodox foundations. So I wasn't too interested until he started releasing more like balance drills and eight seven steps of the lotus drills that i started to become more enamored because it's like okay this is the stuff i was looking for and it's not just forms and it's not just orthodox because i trained a lot of orthodox before that so i was very interested in getting into the inebriation of it all yeah but uh then he uh he announced this online course which i became a part of very quickly so i started studying all the videos that he had out and I started to inquire with him, like, hey, man, could I come and like, train in person? And at the time, he was already like halfway into a full-time training session. So I decided to come in the next year so I could start at the beginning. And uh, he's, yeah, just like I said with before, with uh, he was happy that I already had good shapes that he could work with. I already knew all the forms. If, if anything about me, I'm a forms machine. I can take a form and then just absorb it whether through video or or in person like my brain just works for that kind of thing it was more more important though that i started to get the inner mechanics of it all which is exactly what we got to work on when i got to meet him in person so i i got to skip a lot of the the uh, beginning shape stage training because i already had that down at that point so when you were doing this um it, was it more or less a live-in program with him that you did when you were going to Canada? Just more like a full-time program? Pretty much, yeah. Like, I uh, I just, like, rented a local, like, a uh, Airbnb right. or a rent place. And then just when I wasn't training with him, I was training on my own. <laughs> yeah. And then we'd go meet at the school, and we'd have our full-time practice. And then we'd have, like, his, his other classes because he still had, like, regular classes he was teaching. And we'd be incorporating that, too. So it was just really much like a like a family because you get in there, you get a bunch of people in that are all doing the same thing. We're all 
really toiling through <laughs> eight hours of training a day plus a quota. And then we get to meet all the other students and then just get the <laughs> crap rocked out of us <laughs> in sparring, which was really like my favorite part of it is just because I didn't get a lot of like, uh, it wasn't that there was, it was devoid, but there wasn't as enough sparring and interaction in my opinion. But uh, once once I met Sherp O'Neill and his students, I got that interaction. Got the interaction. <laughs> I've I've always been curious about that. Um, you know, when you when you do sparring, like in a drunken, uh, you know, uh, when you're using drunken kung fu to do sparring, uh, what what sort of things are you doing there? Does does one person fight in a more or less uh, orthodox fashion, and the other one fight in a in a drunken fashion? Or are you both fighting in drunken style, or how does that work? Is it a mixture? <laughs> It can go very poorly, very quickly, <laughs> depending on the answer. Yeah. So, I mean, it's usually like whatever we're working on, right? Because like the, the strength of the mob family system, I think, is that it creates, like, even though we're all working under the same banner, it all creates us as very different martial artists because we all tend to specialize in one area or another. One may specialize in tiger, another mantis, another drunken boxing. Mine was drunken boxing. So getting to spar with like a Riel's mantis style, she was very sharp and quick. It was very hard to not get pummeled. And then dealing with Stacy's Shina Lilha, that was also a good way to get pummeled, just getting rammed through. But uh, then when I met uh, uh, Sammy, my Kung Fu brother, he, uh, he also specialized in drunken Kung Fu. So whenever we got together and started doing drunken on drunken, it was very... <laughs> It was very much like two drunks just stumbling, like <laughs> trying to get to the next bar. Right. But uh, he did a little violent in between. Yeah. But uh, as far as like uh, how the sparring goes, when it's like against Orthodox, it's very much like you're, the idea is you're trying to make them drunk with you. Uh -huh. So the the primary uh, gin of uh, drunken boxing is Fujin or a floating gin, like the uprooting power. And how we kind of, like uh, interpret that in drunken boxing is the idea that when you're in like reverse structure so we're like bent backwards that's like okay we're drunk but we kind of train how to handle ourselves in a drunken situation but if we put someone else into a back bend and they haven't trained drunken boxing or something similar then it's like you know they haven't they can't handle their mind very well so we just want to get our opponent drunk together with us but since they don't have the experience they can't fight us really in that situation so it's very much about uprooting and and uh, knocking them off balance by making them do the same sort of things that we do. So it can either go, if it's in favor of the orthodox fighter, where they just start pummeling us, or if it's in favor of the drunken boxer, we, we end up both doing drunken boxing, but they do drunken boxing very poorly at the end. Interesting. It's an interesting strategy. Yeah. So how long yeah. did you train with uh, Shifu Ripsky in that uh, full-time mode, would you say? Uh, let's see. That'd be around like six to seven years-ish now. Like I, I talked with him online for a couple of years before that, but six or seven years of just hard full-time training. And were you traveling with him at that time as well? When, when he would go to some places like Israel and Thailand, you would just sort of go along? or uh, That started around like year three. Because uh, year one, we were in uh, BC and in, in, uh, in uh, Creston. And then year two and three, we were like meeting in Edmonton, Alberta. And then uh, it was right around year three, like he started this uh, grand opening where uh, he was going to open up his new school, which didn't end up working out. But it was around that time that uh, we were planning a trip to Thailand. And uh, he didn't end up going because of uh, the grand opening. But uh, my Kung Fu brother, Sammy, was still going. So we, like, we both attended the uh, grand opening and then went to Thailand together. So we went deeper into drunken boxing while we were there. And then it was around mid-year after that, that uh, he went to Israel and I was going to meet him there. And uh, at the first, I thought, because like he was also playing the UK trip, like, a couple weeks after that. And so I wanted to go to Israel because... Like it was a very like interesting place, very different than anything I've ever been to before. And I was like, I want to see the sites. I want to see like all the all the holy sites that you think about. Right. So I decided to go to Israel. And then when I got back, you know, I got bored here at home 
and then like hearing about now he's going to go to the UK I'm like all right let's go to the UK <laughs> so I traveled with him there and uh met uh, James Screeton where uh, he hosted us and then we had our full time there and uh yeah those were like a lot of my bigger travels which all happened in the span of the year and then uh since then we gone across like Canada and across the states but haven't been out since then I am planning to go out to, to Israel again within the couple next couple months he is planning to do another full time and I'm planning to attend and help him teach so I'm hoping to get out there again awesome that sounds like fun um so at what point did he decide that he wanted you to open up a school there in McHenry how long had you been training with him that was around when uh the his uh, reopening or his grand opening was going to be happening. He had uh, discussed it because he was planning to uh, essentially like put together like a Jing Wu of sorts yeah. where like multiple teachers were going to be teaching under the same roof. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when he told me that I needed to start teaching so I could start to expand my knowledge through the teaching, uh, I wanted to essentially do the same thing because I'm like, this is like a really cool idea. Just have multiple teachers under the same roof. And then after classes, we can all just collaborate and just get along and practice together that'd be awesome so i started to try to do it the same thing here like when he told me that i needed to and uh didn't end up working out i tried to get together with my uh first kung fu teacher and uh he didn't like that i was with other teachers wow. so that didn't work out very well but uh so i just started to uh open up my first school which was in a storage unit <laughs> luckily in the indoor storage units <laughs> 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 for winter and all that but uh, yeah, I, I taught there for around a year to year and a half-ish, somewhere in there. And like I had uh, Bill, one of my first students, who was actually like uh, one of my Kung Fu brothers from the first Kung Fu school I went to. He'd been a regular student of mine since I started teaching. And uh, so he was my first. And then I got uh, Andrew, my second student, who uh, who heard that I was teaching out of the storage unit. And he was like, Oh, that's pretty traditional. I better meet this guy. <laughs> True. So, storage unit is a classic go-to for somebody starting their own. Uh, you know, not many people know that. I've been there myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, how did you How did you feel when he asked you? Um, well, you were pretty enthusiastic about it, I guess. But what sorts of things um, did you find it? Did you find the challenge of starting a new school was distracting you from your own training, or did you just sort of take it all in stride as part of it, part of the learning process? I don't think it really distracted me in any way it was, and if anything it was like really to bolster my kung fu because uh well we all have that those times in our lives where we run out of training partners right yeah. by having students you kind of like bring the training partners to you <laughs> albeit yeah. at differing skill levels but it really like uh this this kind of gets into the the secrets of teaching but uh when we're teaching somebody uh a particular like principle we're also practicing our own principles right our or at least our level of the principles so whenever trying to de demonstrate to a student like a technique or an idea or some level of internal we also get to like experience like the uh, feedback right like if something didn't quite work the way that we expected it to but maybe a different way or if something worked a lot better than what we expected it to do and we can be like oh hey that worked what i do differently and so we can kind of bolster ourselves based on that so if anything i find it to be a very mutually beneficial relationship where i get to teach you and then you get to teach me because i get to get that feedback and then because my skill level is increasing then your skill level can also increase because we're increasing together totally agree i i really am a big believer that teaching someone how to do something is the best way to learn it yourself. And there's, oh, been yeah. times where, you know, I've taught something to someone thought that I knew it until I showed it to them. And then I was like, Oh, and that's what <laughs> the was trying to teach me. You know, I, I thought that I knew it, but I didn't quite know it yet. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I didn't quite buy it, but until I started teaching myself, like yeah. my portfolio told me like, you'll learn more from teaching than you ever will from me. And I'm like, no, man, you, you opened my eyes to so many things. And like, I can't possibly learn more than I learned from you. And then I started teaching him like, oh, I can see that now. Yeah, you're, you're right. 
like I, not to discredit what he taught me, but uh, he was absolutely right. That that experience is like the most important thing. And and then getting to the point where you can start to experience and grow yourself and not just be told to do the next thing. It really starts to make you think and starts to really get you increased in level, like not just uh, not just increase in level because like they were told to do something and then they do it, but you actually put your mind into it. If, if anything, Sherpa Neil has given me that I can put at the, the highest value. It's just teaching me how to think, teaching me how to take these things apart and de deconstruct them and reconstruct them and, and study them, not just to do things because Triple told us to. Right. Yeah, it makes you take responsibility for your own practice and then some because you've got other people you're responsible for as well. So yeah. did you start your school before the pandemic? Yep. yep. And it, was... it survived the whole thing quite well, I imagine. It seems to have. We we managed to skirt by. Skirt by. Yeah. We we had to quarantine like completely for a while, so I had to shut down the school. But uh, I did like once lockdown ended, we did reopen, and then most of my regulars came back. There was a few that didn't come back just because you know, scare of COVID and all, which uh -huh. is understandable. But yeah, I ended up like losing like a a tidy group that I was teaching at a chiropractic because like you know. It was all like uh, higher risk individuals. Yeah. We didn't want to risk that. But uh, all my regular, like my dedicated students, they all came back and we've been slowly making our way back up since then. So is there anything that you would say that sets apart your school as far as curriculum or the way that you guys train from like Neil's school when he had an in-person school? Is it different at all? Do you focus on different things? Um, there's a lot of ways I can take that. Like, uh, as far as like materials go, I think it's the, the strength of the Ma family system is in my opinion is because it's many different arts as one art. And it gives us like a lot of different perspectives. It's like, uh, it's kind of like a proto Bagua Zhang in a way we use the, the, uh, pre heaven Bagua fixture and we put a system in each like gua configuration and we explain like okay this is why this system is in this gua this is what it represents as a martial strategy this is what it represents as like a body type this is what it represents as like how we fight and then we kind of look at those and then we like cross reference between them it's like okay i may like specialize in drunken boxing but like what does it in tiger share drunken boxing and tiger the way we kind of like think about it is like they're on the opposite ends but they still have a lot that they share. They both share Fujin, which like Fujin is like the big thing in drunken boxing, but uh, in tiger boxing is basically, I want to rip you off your feet so I can put you on the ground and eat you. That's right. kind of like the mind. So they both share that aspect. And because we have like all these systems, we start to cross-reference things and see where they uh, start to align. And it's like when we go up the mountain as we're trying to uh, pursue our martial virtues and such we start to see like crossing paths because we never go straight up the mountain because you start to wear yourself out that way you always go in zigzags or you start to circle up so when you get those zigzag points you start to have intersections along the way and those intersections are points that you share and you can see so like a taiji chuan has a taijin or the plucking jin and a mantis Tai Jin is its like primary Jin. It's all about plucking. So if you learn plucking from Mantis, you can kind of understand plucking from Tai Ji. It's just a little bit different body types, but same kind of theory. So then you essentially, uh, you do a lot of the work in the other systems before you get to these systems over here. So it gives you a lot of different perspectives in my opinion. And the, the true art is when all these systems kind of become one system instead of individual systems. But before it becomes one, you see them as different. And then you start to see where they overlap. And then it becomes one system again, where we're no longer these different systems, but we're, we're one system that's, instead of changing binarily, we change between systems like a wave. So I, a punch may start with a mantis structure that then might change to a more shingy structure on the way in. So that change is really where my family starts to come in together it's not the separate systems but they all blend together into one tidal wave 
of a power, if it were. That's fascinating. So if, if you if you have a new student, like say someone comes to you that's completely a beginner, what do you do? You generally start them out in the same thing, or do you sort of try to assess them based on their physicality, or uh, how does that work? It's very much like a diagnosis when I start with them. We start everybody with like the basic kung fu basics, you know, horse stance. Here's how to reverse punch and all that. We give them like a very flavorless foundation, and then I start to examine like who is this person, what do they need. So is this person like high on their ego? Maybe they need to be taken down a peg before they can start to really learn because otherwise they're not going to learn anything if they're thinking they're all high and mighty already. So maybe I give them something they suck at. If if they're like a bigger guy, maybe I give them monkeys so they have to jump around a bunch. Or maybe if uh, on the other end of the spectrum, if someone's very unconfident, maybe I need to give them something to give them more confidence. So give them something that they're already kind of good at and then just refine that. So in a way like a, uh, Riel was one of a uh, Triff O'Neill students and she was a very skinny girl. And so she was given Mantis, which kind of bolsters that kind of structure. It's very inwards, very close, very compact kind of structure. So she was a nightmare to deal with in sparring. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and then once you learn, like the first thing that's, it's, it's basically all about how to balance the person, how to balance the ego, how to gain confidence if you have no confidence how to settle the ego if you have too much and then start to incorporate the other systems once you've already balanced yourself your inner self if that makes sense yeah it totally makes sense so you um you teach both in person and online right correct so when in your online teaching could you explain a little bit about how that works like what could people expect for that if they're trying to find you online what sort of curriculum do you have there so it all started as like kind of a, like a Patreon program where like I make video lessons and then you can sign up and then you gain access to those video lessons of which currently there's over 200 videos. So it's way too many for me to even keep track of now, yeah. but it, it started as like a, a long fist training system because long fist is kind of like the, uh, the easiest of the systems to kind of wrap your head around and understand. So I thought it a good starting point for people starting in practice to to uh, get something to latch onto as well as something a little bit easier for me to teach online because it's difficult when you can't quite be in person. So it started as a long fist program, which then I started getting more people asking me for other things. So I started to incorporate Tai Ji Tren and uh, Xin Liu He and Ba Gua Zhang and 18 Lo Han Palm and a little bit of aspects of the Ma family system as well. So there's there's a really a, like a bit smorgasbord of things that are currently available of which I also am starting to branch out into like more Zoom-esque meetings, like private lessons. Mm. I actually uh, just used this last seminar like a couple weeks ago as like a testing point for which I could do live classes because I was uh, essentially like having that live at the same time for people who paid to have it come and see it live. So that was my testing point to start more Zoom-esque meetings for the same thing so you can train both like a not in person but in virtual person as well as like a pre-recorded lessons yeah uh, a lot of people might not realize if they've never tried it before that those the zoom martial arts classes can actually be quite good i mean you know there's no substitute for the real thing you know being people being in the same room but you can learn an amazing amount um you know through uh zoom you know, oh and, absolutely and it, with anything like a like I started with Neil, Triple Neil, through uh, through his online class. So if if that's anything, I, I guess I could be proof of that. I, I got all those shapes, which made it easy for when we got in person to start putting internal into it. I find like the, the people who best benefit from these kinds of things are people who like have nothing at all. They have no shapes. So they can start to, you know, build their foundational shapes, start to get conditioned, right? So they can start to build that base that then they can start to get that experience later on, maybe with a teacher in person as well. People start to benefit if they already have a lot of experience, like a uh, Shrivel Neil has a lot of like online students who are already teachers of different arts. So it's really just a matter of taking what they already have and then just thinking about it a little bit differently. Right. That That's where I think online classes really starts to benefit is 
both creating the shapes for the beginner student and then for the more advanced students, they can start to think about their things differently, start to incorporate different things because they already have that in-person like benefit through their other teachers. So they can just start to incorporate the same things. Nice. So you um, you write as well, as I mentioned in the introduction, you've written quite a few books. Um, are you writing anything right now? Do you have anything in new books coming out in the future? I am starting a very large project. Yeah, oh, a, a very big. Uh, I, I imagine it will be a tidy tome. <laughs> right. Because uh, my, my current project is basically going to be a, a tidy tome of all the different family systems that I, that I practice, as well as that I've like run across. So I, I currently practice Yang style and Chen style the most. I also do a little bit of ch Chen paneling. And uh, then I've run across like Wu style systems and the Sun style systems. And so I'm basically trying to make this book as like a, a bridge from the divide because there can be a lot of horrible politics in martial arts world. Boy, howdy, and, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people being like, my system's better than your system, shake my fist at you. And so I'm kind of using this as like a, here's where we all share, right? Because it's all the same principles, just different shapes, different flavors. So I'm going to use this book as a kind of way to say, here's what's different and here's what's the same. So that you can look into it. Like if you prefer a certain flavor, you can pursue it, but you can also see like, there's nothing really dividing us here. We're all the same at the end of the day. We're all from the same family. Yeah, I like that attitude. That's kind of what we're trying to do here. I think it's time for everybody to start moving past the whole my dad can beat up your dad phase. We never really stop being kids, do we? <laughs> I guess not. Apparently not. Um, so um, you, uh, your, your school now, um, I, I guess you mentioned that you're planning on traveling to Israel soon. Are you taking any of your students with you on that trip or is it just going to be you? I imagine it'll just be me because a lot of my students are busy with their lives and uh, some are busy with kids. Right. So I, I don't imagine I'll be able to take them with me. If they're willing to come, I'll absolutely take them with me. But usually it's just me when I go on these cross-continental trips. Yeah, probably simpler that way. Yeah. So, you you know, obviously you spent a great deal of time studying with Shifa Ripsky and you, you trained with some other teachers as well. Uh, some of them are are fairly well known, like uh, George Zhu, you trained with a little bit, you mentioned. What was that like? Yeah, I heard he's quite a character. Oh, yeah, it was quite a deal. Like, it, it was very much like a breaking point in my martial journey, because he was talking of all these like high level internal things that Shifa O'Neill was starting to introduce to me. And I was starting to try to think like, oh, OK, I can kind of wrap my head around that, even though I don't physically understand what that means yet. But getting to feel it firsthand from someone who's been doing it for years and then not quite understanding exactly what is going on with his body. <laughs> it was quite an eye opener. Like I was I was sitting in my hotel room at the end of the first day wondering, like, what am I doing? Like it was, it was kind of like the, the one point in my life where. I wondered, should I give up martial arts? Wow. Just because I'm dealing with all the insecurities of like, I can't do what he's doing and I don't even think I can even try to do what he's doing. Should I just stop? Yeah. So from that point on, I just like, okay, insecurities aside, let's just keep going. And uh, though I couldn't understand at the time, I think I'm starting to wrap my head around at least some of the things he was talking about. But uh, basically to mention a few things like uh, you know like when uh, people are allowed to touch the teacher to feel what's going on in their body feel all the interactions it was very interesting because i never felt anything quite like him i was feeling around his dantian i was feeling around different aspects of his legs and his uh torso just to feel what was going on and it was like it was like it was so refined that i couldn't feel anything but yet there was power shooting out of it it was like a, there was like a void where I was touching nothing, but then there's power shooting out of the void and you don't know where the power is coming from, but it's whole, oh, it's there. <laughs> and there's even like a video, like someone did of like the trailer for the seminar of me getting rocked a couple of times in that seminar. <laughs> but it was very, very eye-opening, very eye-opening indeed. 
Yeah, that's a humbling experience for people who've never experienced anything like that and think that that sounds like sort of a woo-woo uh, description. You know, you should you should find yourself a teacher on that level and get that experience yourself because it is a real thing and it's very unsettling and it's very humbling. Um, Absolutely. A long time ago, I used to do Aikido and I'd been doing it for about five years. I went to Chicago and um, there was a woman in the school I went to train at. She wasn't an instructor. She was a tiny little old Japanese woman. She was in her late seventies. She had cancer and she asked me if I wanted to practice with her. And I said, sure. And she was just like that. You know, she was able to just keep just dropping me to the ground. I couldn't feel what she was doing. I couldn't tell what she was doing. I just, I kept losing my center and getting dropped. And I was laughing because, you know, it was like a magic trick or something. And so she said, how long have you been practicing? And I said, five years. And she was like, really? <laughs> you know, like, doesn't seem like <laughs> It is a very humbling experience. I had that same feeling like, am I, should I even be doing this? But you know, yeah, it's interesting. My, my first experience with that kind of feeling actually was when I was still with my first Kung Fu teacher, when I met uh, Master Wei Chung Lin from a, he was a teaching in Skokie at the time at a, a, I can't remember the exact name, Taoist Internal Martial Arts Association. I think that was it. But uh, he was probably my first experience with that kind of, that kind of thing. His big thing was called the pre-heaven power method, of which you're, I currently have my camera sitting on one of his, his uh, master's books, which uh, is basically initiating power from the feet, but not just in pushing the ground, but actually using the, the calves and the balls of the feet to create the circles. Whereas like we usually think of like rotate Dantian to create our circular movement. It was kind of like that, but using that with the ball of the feet. So you use the balls of the feet to create the circles, which is very interesting. And uh, it was like the most unexplainable thing to me at the time, especially because it was like the first time I had an, in an interaction like that. And my probably my favorite story to talk about it is because uh, I went to all of his seminars. And after the first one of his seminars on the pre and power method, which was my first introduction to him in person, I asked him, cause we, we were all like doing partner work. And so I only got to feel him a few times. So I asked him if he would be willing to uh, let me feel a little bit. Right. And uh, he, he smiles and he turns to one of his students. This guy wants to go for a ride. Oh, nice. So he went into the back room where he had these like foot thick wall mats that were oh, all no. like on boards. <laughs> <laughs> and like i grab him and then yeah. he just shake me off of him and i'd fly into the wall mat just slap it <laughs> like and just over and over again it was like i was being thrown by a train <laughs> yeah wow it was quite an experience yeah that's an incredible experience so somebody else that i, I noticed that you train with a little bit is uh joshua and uh, who's actually my teacher um nice uh, yeah, and I I saw a couple of your videos that you, where you were doing like Wudong style martial arts, and it, it was pretty good. And I, that was before I knew that you trained with him. I don't know if he was the only Wudong guy that you trained with, but um, could you talk about that a little bit? Did you train with him intensively, or did you just sort of like um, attend a few of his seminars, or um, what was your interaction with him like? I I attended two of his seminars, which actually Master Lin was uh, uh, hosting at the time, oh. so I got to train with him in, in a Master Lin school. So I, we learned the uh, Shen Wu Chen and the Tai Wu Xing Chen. Yeah. And uh, then I bought all of his DVDs after that because <laughs> I really wanted to get as much as I could out of him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's very, very nice and very pleasant dude. Also very scary when he wants to be. <laughs> yeah, he's a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was a really great time. The, the first time I went there was when we learned the Shen Wu Chen, which is my introduction to him. And uh, then... For the Tai Wu Xing trend, it was actually a neat collaboration where I was working with a uh, shuffle Steve Kleppi at the time, and uh, he had learned like uh, almost all the Tai curriculum at that time. He like traveled to Shaolin Wudang multiple trips, and uh, so Tai Wu Xing trend was the last thing that he needed to complete the curriculum worth of uh, material, and uh, so I got to be the the one to be like, hey there's this guy, let me introduce you. Oh, nice. <laughs> which, which was very cool because it's like bringing my current teacher to meet teachers that I've also had previous experience with. So it's like 
bringing together of all the worlds, which was a really nice thing. And we all had a very great time. And yeah, Shifo was very grateful. He, he gave me a couple of uh, uh, forms that uh, he didn't teach anyone yet at the time, which was very neat. Oh, very nice. It's a great story. Yeah. So you've, you've traveled around quite a bit and you've taught quite a bit and learned from a lot of good teachers. Um, at this point, where, where do you, what do you see as the future of these arts? What do you see as the future of uh, uh, these internal arts that we practice, these traditional Kung Fu arts that we practice? What do you think the future is? I don't think it's necessarily going to change in a big way, so to speak, like uh, in as far as like going to get a resurgence or anything. Cause I think with the whole tidy trend and health, like a pick, they have already had that. Yeah. But I don't think it's gonna go anywhere at least anytime soon. Cause as far as like like uh as far as like international round, it's always gonna be around as like health art for sure. Yeah. And I think there's enough weirdos like us who are gonna keep the, the martial arts part of it alive. So I don't think it's gonna die anytime soon. It might see some more like uh it might see some more like a uh, MMA type interactions because that ever since like Xu Xiaodong and uh, all the uh, like all the videos of like the fake masters getting beat up right. that really caused the resurgence of like people like trying to put the martial part back into it or at least trying to emphasize it again and then show how it could interact with like cage fighters and such and then started to incorporate some of like Brazilian jiu-jitsu into their arts so if anything, it, it might go through like an evolution of sorts, but I definitely don't think it's going to lose anything, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. I totally agree. I think one way or another, it's it's all to the good. If people start training in a more martial fashion, it's it's not going to hurt anything for sure. Absolutely. So we're just about out of time. Would you like to tell everybody where they can find you and your school and find out more about you? Sure. I'm I'm on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all sorts of things. If you want to get to my uh, my website, it's a uh, red jade dash or uh, red jade daniel dash sun dot webno dot com. So that's my main website of which you can access all of my other like social medias and such through there through the different links. But I have a also have a martial arts blog of which I write regularly and uh, set a uh, red jade uh, red jade martial arts McHenry WordPress. And I'll be leaving a lot of these links. But uh, then there's also my uh, Facebook page, which Danny Schultz is like the main account where I interact. Then there's also Red Jade McHenry, which is like the page for my school. So you get any information on like updates through there. And uh, yeah, I also have my Lulu account for my books, if anybody's interested in my books. And then my Patreon account for my in online classes, of which I'll have to give you all the links at the end of this for sure. Yeah. And we'll provide links to all those in the um, description for the, um, for the video and the interview there. So I encourage everybody to check that out. Um, Daniel, you're, you're doing good work out there trying to connect people and, and promote the arts. And we really appreciate talking to you today. Thank you very much.